and welcome back. Today we're going to be going over more historical products and this time it's going to be of the Victorian era. You know, the time period that's notorious for a lot of coal smoke clogging up the entire sky and the fresh scent of sewage on all the streets. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yay! So grab your top hat, lace up your boots and get ready for a day filled with rigid social norms, relentless pollution and the constant fear of cholera. Ah, Victorian mornings, where everything is propriety, prosperity, and plague. Don't forget to like and subscribe, though, if you want more great content just like this. Yeah. Now, have you ever heard of a train that sailed across the sea? Welcome to one of the weirdest and most fascinating pieces of Victorian engineering, the Brighton and Rottingdam Seashore Electric Railway. Built in 1896, this ambitious project was designed to glide just above the waterline with its enormous legs towering over the waves. And it was nicknamed the Daddy Long Legs for that reason. I mean, you could kind of see why. It just, it just looks like a spider. And this marvel of electric power transportation promised seaside travelers a smooth ride between Brighton and Rottingdean. When the tides cooperated, that is. So Magnus Volt, already known for his successful Volt Electrics Railway, was tired of dealing with the difficult terrain between the two locations of Brighton and Rottingdean. So he decided to create a more useful way of getting around. The railway used two parallel tracks laid on concrete sleepers in the seabed with a single pier-like car called the Pioneer, nicknamed the Daddy Long Legs, elevated on four 23-foot long legs. It was powered by two general electric motors and the overhead electric lines. It also had a steam powered station for generally generating electricity and rotting dam. Now construction took about two years between 1894 and 1896 and the railway officially opened on the 28th November in 1896. However, it was severely damaged by a storm just days later, meaning Volt had to rebuild it all with even taller legs but it was able to reopen again one year later on July 20th, 1897. And by the end of that year alone, it carried over 44,000 passengers, offering a unique sea voyage on wheels experience. Now, the railway did not go completely smoothing. It had a lot of difficulties, mainly the seas. The sea slowed it down a lot at high tide. It didn't work that well. You know, who thought a train track going underwater would work all the time? And Volt never was able to afford to improve the motors. But what really did it in is that the council decided to add in a barrier to protect the beach from getting eroded away, which meant that Volt would have had to reroute the line all the way around the protective barrier. And he just simply didn't have the money to do so. So unfortunately, in 1901, the railway was shut. It was over. Four and a half, five years, minus the times that it was closed, because it was closed a lot due to repairs and... and issues. It was a success. A lot of people loved it and a lot of people took it. And it's a great piece of Victorian history. And while you're curious if this is still there and you can go see it, well, yes and no. Most of the track, the car, and other structures were sold off for scrap. But as of 2021, you could still go see some of the sleepers that are left there at low tide, if you're interested. Ah, uh, Velocipedes, the early precursor to the bicycle. Now, back when the 1817s, Velocipedes were rapidly developing, and they developed vastly between 1817 to 1880, where after that they kind of just became bicycles. But these are officially the birth of the bicycle, the most famous being the penny farthing, the really big one with the tiny wheel that people sit on. There's still penny farthing racings today if you're interested. But back then, there were loads of different types of them invented. Two wheels, one wheels, three wheels, four wheels, even up to five wheels sometimes. And they were all different purposes, all different styles, depending on the need of the cycler. You had ones that, like the penny farthing, you sat up on top, or for women or men who, you know, don't want to fall and hurt themselves, there were types that you could sit inside of and have the giant wheels around you. There were even designs where the person sat inside of a giant hamster ball-like cage thing I found, but I couldn't find any evidence of that one being used in history, so I'm not including it in this video. However, there's still a lot that are a bit more proven to have existed for us to look at here in this picture over to the side. M my favorite one being this monocycle. It's absolutely terrifying. I don't even know how you get on it. I don't even want to think about how you get on it. It, it. It's scary. Or you have this one where there's no pedals at all. It's just walking. You're just walking. I don't understand how you move quicker without pedals. I would assume this is just kind of like walking or gliding really quickly. 
But it's a type of a velocipede that um is pretty cool to look at. I don't know what it was with the Victorians. They like sticking wheels on things. Like more wheels were the better. You can find early evidences of roller skates or rollerblades where wheels were the size of their legs just bolted on either side and they were just scoot around. There's no brakes. Brakes were not a thing though. And while most of these throughout the 1800s were made out of wood, during the 1870s, advances in metal started to create velocipedes made out of metal instead. And this is when they became more robust and closer to the bicycle. Solid rubber tires started to be added and their long spokes that we're kind of familiar with today allowed the rides to be a lot smoother and have some shock absorbance so that you're not just, you know, clacking your teeth as you drive down the cobbles all the time. I mean, there's a reason that the early versions of this were all called the bone shakers. I don't know, that doesn't make me want to get on a bike. It's called the bone shaker. I wonder what it does. It must be a very smooth ride for it to not shake all your bones for it to be called the bone shaker. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure there are places where you can go out to test a penny farthing, but I am absolutely scared to get that high off the ground on a giant wheel with no balance. I can ride a bicycle, but this is a bicycle on difficulty mode. This one down here in the corner looks like you pedal with your hands, which is kind of really nifty, especially if you're in a really long skirt. Because weren't these women's skirts like many, many layers and super heavy? So I kind of wish there was ways where they would just remake all of these and you could try them out. There's probably reasons. Probably a very important reason called safety. Maybe, maybe you, maybe it's better to not drive these. <laughs> oh, the spoon warmer. An invention that I think is absolutely beautiful and amazing and adorable all at the same time. So back in the day, not all the houses had heatings and some of the homes in the winter were super, super cold. And by the time the food made it to the kitchen table, they might have had to travel a lot of ways. I should preface this. This is for like big stately homes. And this was not like a middle class item. This was for the rich only. So from the time they made it from their kitchen and walked 30 floors up their giant mansion to the dining table, the food might not be able to stay as warm as it should be. And by putting in cold cutlery into their soups or whatnot, it would cool it down even quicker. So the spoon warmer was invented. I don't know why there's not a fork warmer. Or knife warmer. It's just a spoon warmer. What it basically was, was a small dish with little legs on it. Leggies are important, so it wouldn't burn the table. And inside, boiling water would be poured. From in there, you would rest your spoon so that the spoon stayed warm until you were ready to put it in your soup and scoop out your hot soup. And that way it wouldn't cool your soup down too much. Now, it is important to note that these are considered rare. Very few of them have shown up in history and most of the time they're at expensive auctions and they get quite extravagant. You can find ones that were made into shapes like giant fish, shells, frogs, fish, helmets, sheep horns, ram horns, other extravagant random pieces of metal work that might be art or abstract art. I'm not entirely sure. Basically anything that you could put water in and then stick a spoon in could be turned into a spoon warmer. Now the idea for it to exist today is pretty comical, but it's an interesting piece of history to remind us what life was like before heating was really a thing, you know, outside of the random fireplace at the end of one room. Seriously though, why did they not care about keeping their forks warm or their knives warm? It's just the spoons. You eat with the other things too. I guess because so little the metal touches it. I'm not sure. Again though, these are for the super, super rich and they wouldn't be found in your average Victorian household at all. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure you give it a like and click subscribe so you never miss out when I upload another video. I'm quickly becoming the history VTuber. Um, it's okay because I'm enjoying it and I hope you guys are too. But otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And if you have any other topics you think would be great for me to look into or weird historical objects that can make a great video, feel free to leave it in the comment section below and maybe I'll make a video on it. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, until next time, bye!